I'm Joe Devine, and welcome to Whiteboard Football Extra. In this series of short podcasts, we'll be talking to the writers of our videos, taking a more in-depth look at the topics they choose to discuss. We'll also be engaging with user comments, so if after watching a video you have follow-up questions, we have an opportunity to answer them. A seemingly orthodox formation realised to perfection. Maurizio Sarri and Napoli are producing arguably the most attractive football in Syria, and today I'm joined by Alex Stewart to talk about this in a little bit more depth. Alex, in the video you mentioned that Napoli aimed to cut off the opposition's passing angles during the press. Um, presumably attempting to force errors in this fashion is actually safer than charging in for the tackle. Is that is that true? I think that is true. Um, pressing has undergone an evolution. So when we saw, say, an Ajax side in the early 70s pressing, you would have pretty much you know, nine or ten people running straight at the ball. Um, and I think pressing is always a balance between maintaining a defensive shape but also putting the opposition under pressure. One way of doing that, and it was the sort of Jupp Heynckes style, um, is, is you send a person after the ball, but then you also move the other players on your side to press the passing angle rather than the man in possession itself. And I think what that does is it allows a team to retain its defensive cohesion and its shape uh, while also putting the opposition under pressure. You don't want to stand off so that you can have two perfectly aligned rows of four. You do need to put the opposition under some pressure. But at the same time, if you're just getting dragged massively out of shape like those early Ajax teams were, that's not effective either when you've got players that are quick and technical and can pass around that. So presumably the players, I mean, we talk about this quite a lot with pressing, but presumably the players need a higher level of energy to maintain that throughout a game, particularly if they have to sort of focus on cutting off the passing lanes rather than just running at at somebody. That's absolutely true. I think when when you're looking at the fitness of a player, it's not just the, the cardiovascular fitness being able to run around a lot, as you clearly have to when you're pressing, particularly in a, a very high pressing style. Those players need to be able to think uh, intelligently and tactically, even in the later stages of a game. And it requires enormous fitness to be able to maintain those levels of concentration, to have that decision making when you've been running around for 60, 70 minutes. Having that awareness of the pitch, where the other players are, where your teammates are, and still having the energy to, to, you know, compress the opposition space requires extraordinary levels of fitness and concentration and I think the two go hand in hand. You discussed Napoli's high defensive line in the video. How important is compactness within a defensive system like this? It's it's a feature of Italian football that was introduced by Arrigo Sacchi. The idea of having 25 metres, no more than 25 metres between the the furthest forward player and the the defensive line, the the centre backs, um, assuming that your full backs are pushing up a little bit, your centre backs will be the furthest back. The easiest way of looking at it is that if you bunch your players together, they are harder to pass through because there's less space in between them. But what it also does is it shifts the opposition backwards towards their own goal. And opposition teams are obviously going to most be most vulnerable to having the ball turned over the closer they are to their own goal because it's much then it's then much easier and quicker for you to turn that into an attacking opportunity for yourself so i think the high defensive line serves two purposes firstly it makes it easier for napoli to defend in terms of how they they like to press simply because they compact the space into which the opposition can move but it also facilitates the counter-attacking style, uh, at the quick turnover, because they've they've moved the opposition back, and about fifty percent of all of Napoli's games take place in in the middle third, because they they like to push that high up. And when you've got Pepe Reina behind, who is he, he, you know he's not a brilliant sweeper keeper, but he's very competent. And he's very confident in his own abilities to organise that defensive line and to push them high. 
then it, it's absolutely crucial to the way Napoli both defend and attack. So when a team does compress the spaces between them, obviously you say that makes them harder to play through, but does that not by virtue make them easier to play around or to play over the top, for example? Why is it safer to do this and, and why can't teams just with quick wingers run around the sides of them? In terms of playing over the top, you're absolutely right. Um, and that's why having A, a sweeper keeper and B, a sufficiently organised back four that can play an offside line is very important. And Napoli do, as I pointed out in the video, occasionally get caught out by sides that, that ping long balls over. Um, and you can create too much space between the goalkeeper and, and the defensive line. If you look at someone like Bayern Munich, then they've got Manuel Neuer, who will be right up, you know, almost to the halfway line at times, which obviously negates that. I think we saw Andre Terstegen winning a free kick in the opposition half for, for Barca. So there are ways of countering that by pushing your goalkeeper right right up outside of the box. In terms of passing around, the width or narrowness of a defensive line is obviously quite an important tactical feature. And you can have, like when we looked at the Manchester United team of 2007-8, they defended very wide. Um, and the fact that Rio Ferdinand particularly was as mobile and aware as he was meant that they could cover in those spaces. Whereas if you look at Diego Simeone's Atleti side, they defend very, very narrowly. And it's actually the wide attacking players that, that move outwards to cut off those angles. So I think it doesn't matter which method you choose as long as you've got the right personnel and everyone knows what they're doing. You mentioned that Napoli aim to create overloads between the lines. Can you define what you mean by overloads and which lines they're being created between? So the lines they're being created between most obviously are the midfield line and the defensive line. So if you look at a classic 4-4-2, then you'll have a line of four defenders and a line of four midfielders. And they, generally speaking, particularly the defensive line, will stay aligned with one another. You won't suddenly have a centre-back pushing up enormously and joining the midfield line to make five and leaving a sort of ragged three at the back. If I don't know if you watched the Tottenham Millwall Cup game at the weekend, but after Harry Kane had gone off, uh, there was a passage of play once uh, Son Hyun Min was on where Millwall were dropping further and further back towards their own goal. But their midfield line of four and their defensive line of four stayed pretty well aligned as two banks of four and got closer and closer together. And Sun was eventually able to score because he found space in between those lines. Literally, he stood not next to a player in the midfield four and not next to a player in the defensive four. He dropped back off the defensive four. An overload between the lines, then, is simply having more players in that space than it is having players aligned. Now, if you're operating a, either a man or a zonal marking, generally speaking, you're going to roughly be where your opposition are. And you might push up with them, fall back with them. Um, but there is not a lot of space between players on, on two different sides. What an overload is looking to do is to get a player to three players sometimes into those spaces between the lines so that the defensive line is unsure about whether to push up to meet those players or they've done so because they're operating a man marking system and then that creates space horizontally um, or you want players from the midfield to, to have to drop back um, and that then means that you can push further up the pitch so effectively this is why players like false nines, for example, came into vogue, because a false nine quite overtly drops away from the centre-halves that should be marking him, playing between the midfield line and the defensive line, 
and allows a passing option there where players are struggling to think, well, do I push up to mark him? Do I drop back to mark him? Um, and that's that's where the the overload is. Okay, I'm going to refer us to some user comments now. Phil Piavano calls Marek Hamsik the most underrated player in Serie A. Uh, how important is he to Napoli's system, Alex? Uh, Hamsik is hugely important. Um, I mean, this season alone in the league, he's scored 10 goals. He's got eight assists. Um, he's He's a very technical player he's able to arrive late in the box he's of that midfield three along with Alan and Jorginho he's the one who's got the greatest license to push forward and get into the box uh he's the the club captain I believe as well um so he's you know he's been at Napoli for a long long time he's one of those sort of talismanic players um I think the reason that he makes them them tick is because when they're pushing up the left hand side with with Gulam and Insigne, Hamzik is the one who's able to to take the ball under significant pressure from the opposition uh, and retain it. So he's the one who who is the almost the focal point for those passing triangles, where his uh, physical strength and his technical ability means that that players come into him, which creates space around him, and he is able to hold them off for long enough to then release a pass. He's also very, very good at then himself moving into space. So you get this sort of shuffling effect up the left-hand side where Insigne and Hamzik are playing the ball backwards and forwards to each other, both taking it under pressure, both passing it off and moving on. Um, and when they're able to, to kind of get that clicking, they are extraordinarily difficult to stop. I don't know if he's, I don't know if he's, un, sorry. I, I don't know if he's underrated, um, insofar as I've, I've always found that a slightly difficult term to, to kind of understand. I think people recognize his importance, not just to this Napoli team, but also to previous instantiations that, that Napoli have undergone. Um, but he, he doesn't necessarily get the opportunity to shine on an international stage. Um, as much as he he ought to, I think one of the reasons that that people call players underrated, and not necessarily this commenter, but in in this instance, uh, Marek Hamšík, for example, might be described as underrated because Manchester United didn't pay eighty nine million pound for him. I think big clubs look at at players for different reasons, and while Hamšík is is creative, dynamic, goal scorer, uh, I think. At 29, he's possibly now too old to get a massive move to, to a club like United um, or, or somewhere like Barcelona or, or Real. I think as well, um, he's such a totemic figure at Napoli. I mean, he is almost to Napoli what players like De Rossi and Totti are to Roma. He's been there for such a long time that I think it would take a really significant bid to to prize him away. And given his age, it's not the same sort of investment that you get with someone like Pogba. I think it's also worth noting that actually players don't that often seem to transfer from Serie A to the Premier League. I'm not entirely sure why that is, but off the top of my head, the two moves that I can really remember... Um, from last season, obviously, or from the, the the summer window, obviously Pogba and Martin Darun, um, who moved from Atalanta to Middlesbrough, um, and is a is a sort of very competent ball winning midfielder, but he's not going to set the world alight. Manolo Gabbiadini has obviously moved across as well um, to Southampton, my club, and is is scoring well, but it seems like. The, the English league seem, likes to recruit players, you know, from, from Belgian leagues, from French leagues, um, occasionally from Spain, but, but not quite so much from Serie A. And I don't actually know why that is, given that there are some extraordinarily good players over there. Um, but that, that could be as much of a reason why these sorts of players aren't acquired, uh, as, 
them being underrated. Jesus Escobado, or Jesus, I'm not sure whether to call him Jesus or not, says, I'm lost. If his tactics are so good, why are Napoli 11 points behind Juventus? I think, as we've talked about before, um, in the last pod where we discussed Hoffenheim, uh, and someone very astutely said which which teams will cause Hoffenheim problems, part of the answer that I gave there is, is simply teams with better players. Um, Juventus and Roma, who are also ahead of Napoli currently, are very, very strong sides. They're also very good tactical sides. Um, and just because a team has excellent players and plays in a particularly attractive and uh, systematically and pleasing way, it doesn't mean they're going to win everything. Um, tactics and the players that you have will, will kind of take you to a ceiling. And it may be that that ceiling is higher than everybody else's, uh, like Conte's Chelsea. You know, that, that tactical shift to 3-4-3 three, three works brilliantly with the players that Conte has. And those players are able to, to carry that system to heights under his tutelage, and they're running away with the Premier League. If there were a side that were better, we wouldn't suddenly say, well... Conte's not a good tactician. His players are rubbish. It's just there is the possibility that the teams are better. I think as well, potentially with Napoli, they haven't changed a lot from last season in terms of how they play. Um, Mertens is maybe a, a slightly more false ninety kind of centre forward. Um, but I do think teams need to adapt and innovate a little bit. And it, there's there's possibly an argument that Napoli are too similar to how they were and that the very best sides have found ways of, of figuring them out. Um, but they're still a very, very good team. And and to be, you know, two points off second, very much still in the title hunt, is, is no bad thing. Brendan asks, This looks similar to what Jurgen Klopp is doing with Liverpool, what are the differences? I think in terms of the press, it is similar. Um, I think Klopp is maybe a little more aggressive in the press. Um, I'd say the main differences are up front. Um, Klopp's sort of preferred front three doesn't really feature a striker. Um, there's a lot more mobility and a lot more interplay uh, between, you know, say, Firmino, Mane, and one other. With Mertens, could you not argue the same thing? You could argue it, but Mertens has been effectively converted from a wide player into functioning almost as an out-and-out centre-forward. When Higuain left and went to Juve, um, I think the, the decision was made to to get Mertens to play in a very similar way to how Higuain played. So he loiters much more in the box. He doesn't drop off quite so much. He certainly doesn't play wide uh, in the same way that he used to. I think there's a lot more flexibility in the Liverpool front three. I think sometimes that's a downside to what they do because they don't have a focal point in quite the same way. And you sort of wonder what, you know, might be achieved if they were able to play, say, Sturridge consistently up front, almost at the tip of a kind of Christmas tree formation with with two attacking midfielders behind, like Firmino and Mane, who are able to, to split wide or, or drop deep or whatever they want to do. I mean, players like that, you just give them license. But with with Coutinho, Firmino and Mane, you, you're, none of those are out-and-out -out strikers and Mertens is now an out-and-out -out striker um, after Sarri effectively converted him. I think systematically, yes, you're, you're looking at two sides that play 4-3-3. You're looking at two sides that that like quick vertical transitions. You're looking at two sides that, that press heavily. I think Napoli have just got a bit more of a focal point. Um, and I think possibly at the back as well, Liverpool don't play it around quite so much. I think they like to transition out to the, the wing-backs 
more quickly and they don't look to build the play in those little triangles uh, between a defensive midfielder and the centre backs quite so much. And that may be as well that, you know, their centre backs aren't as comfortable on the ball uh, as Koulibaly particularly is. Alex Stewart, thanks very much. Thanks, Joe. Get it.